Okay, um, hello everyone. Welcome to the third Action Base e seminar. Um, today we've got two more speakers lined up for you. Um, so, first we'll be hearing from Jan Farguera, who's a PhD student um, in Justin Nodra's lab at the University of Toronto. And then we'll be hearing from Rebecca McHugh, who is a postdoc with Paul Hoskerson at the University of Strathclyde. Um, so, if you have any questions for our speakers at any point, um, please leave them in the comments and we'll be fielding those or you can tweet hashtag actionobase03. Um, so for now, I'll hand over to you, Jen. Okay, uh, so I can start my screen now. Okay. 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 Uh, good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you're watching from. As Alicia just said, my name is Jan from the Nodwell Lab at the University of Toronto here in Canada. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about the work I've been doing with regards to understanding how DNA damage affects cell division in streptomyces. All right, so the foundation of my project is based on the idea that prokaryotes come in different shapes and sizes. And I'd like to exemplify this using two model bacteria, the filamentous streptomyces and compare their growth and division to more common bugs such as the rod-shaped E. coli. Now the central question that my project is trying to answer is to understand how cell division is controlled. And in order to effectively answer this question, we need to have a clear understanding of the mechanisms which guide cell division in rod-shaped bacteria. So here's a standard rod-shaped bug like E. coli. They divide by a process known as binary fission. In binary fission, you have a single cell that grows and divides into two separate daughter cells. The process of binary fission depends on a protein known as fit set. Filaments of the protein fit Z coalesce at the center of a dividing cell and create a structure known as the Z ring. The Z ring is essential for cell division because it acts as a scaffold for the recruitment and function of many proteins which drive cell division. Now, another critical component of bacterial cell division is the localization and maintenance of the genome. As the cell is being actively divided, the genome is simultaneously being replicated. And in fact, there are systems in place which inhibit Z ring activity over the replicating genome to avoid genomic breakage. Likewise, if the cell detects any forms of DNA damage, Z-ring activity can be inhibited such that the cell can repair the DNA and recuperate before dividing again. Now in the wild, <clears throat> bacteria can encounter a wide variety of ways with which they can damage their DNA. But the example I wanna to highlight to you today is the effect of antibiotics and bacterial DNA. The example that I'm showing you here is the effect of one molecule in particular known as mitomycin C. The natural product mitomycin C forms a cross-linking bridge between two guanine nucleotides to elicit DNA damage in a bacterial cell. Now with regards to what is known about DNA damage responses in bacteria, this is very well characterized and has been aptly named the SOS response. The SOS response is responsible for upregulating genes important for inhibiting, uh, inhibiting, DNA, uh, inhibiting uh, cell division as well as genes which can repair the DNA. So this leads into the idea that for bacteria, if you induce DNA damage, you can actually regulate the process of cell division. However, I'm not here to talk to you about the E. coli model of this response today. I mean, I'm really here to tell you about the streptomyces. So as many of us know, the streptomyces are gram-positive soil-dwelling bacteria, which produce many of the natural products that we like to study. And what's most interesting about them to me is the fact that as bacteria, they have a very interesting life cycle. That life cycle starts out from a single spore where upon finding a suitable environment will germinate. Upon germination of that spore, the resultant germ tube then burrows deep into the soil substrate and creates a colony known as the vegetative hyphae. Now, the vegetative hyphae grow by tip extension and branching and eventually developmental signals are relayed and received such that the direction of hyphal growth reverses. Rather than growing downwards, the hyphae will break through the soil substrate and create a colony known as the aerial hyphae. Now the aerial hyphae are a significant commitment for the streptomyces because they are in fact committing to the final stage of life, which is spore formation. As the aerial hyphae mature, fit set and many other cell division proteins align themselves along the length of that filament and induce cell division events, which lead to the final compartments, which create spores. Now the final step in spore maturation is the deposition of a pigment in the spore wall, indicating that these spores are mature and can be redistributed back into the environment. Now a take home point I want you to have from this slide is that for streptomyces, cell division is mostly equivalent to spore formation. And another critical point I want you to know about cell division in streptomyces is that although they look very different than E. coli, cell division is actually mostly the same. 
most of the proteins, uh, most of the proteins that guide cell division in E. coli are actually highly concerned with most of the proteins which guide sporulation specific cell division in Streptomyces. The biggest difference is that the Streptomyces have co-opted their function in both time and space to induce sporulation specific cell division. So with this idea then, because of the Streptomyces different life cycle, we can actually uh, study this and discover some really interesting cell biology with regards to how they manage and control this uh, morphological development. So with that then, uh, in comparison to the question that I had posed to you at the start of my talk, that can now be refined to asking how cell division is controlled in Streptomyces. Well, as I also showed you near the start of my talk, if you induce DNA damage in a bacterium, you can actually find ways that cell, uh, that, uh, cell division is regulated. So the ultimate guiding question of my project now becomes, how does DNA damage affect Streptomyces cell division? And then in the Nodwell lab, we've had a couple of clues as to what might be happening to answer that question. So what we have here are three electron micrographs for each stage of the Streptomyces developmental life cycle, from the vegetative to the aerial hyphae, from the aerial hyphae to the sporulation specific cell division events. What we've discovered is that if you grow the Streptomyces in the presence of DNA damaged antibiotics, such as mitomycin C, the cross-linking molecule I showed you earlier, you can actually block the developmental life cycle. So what happens in this situation then is that when you grow the streptomyces in the presence of these uh, DNA damage antibiotics, they grow up up until the aerial hyphae stage, but they, there's a developmental arrest that goes on where they do not continue towards sporulation. However, this is a very morphological answer to the question I just posed to you moments ago. And we wanted to dig deeper than that and ask what, what's happening from a transcriptional point of view. And to that end, we performed an RNA-seq study to assess how the transcriptome changed in response to DNA damage from mitomycin C. So in this experiment, we grew Streptomyces venezuelae uh, in liquid cultures until they approached sporulation and then treated them with mitomycin and then extracted their RNA afterwards to assess how the transcriptome was changing uh, in response to it. From the resultant data set uh, that we, we obtained, we saw, we saw this kind of interesting observation. For the genes involved with cell division, they were all fairly downregulated. And this is a comparison to the genes for sporulation, which only had a subtle effect overall. Now for one gene in particular in the cell division category named SSGB, it appeared to have the highest downregulation event out of the 80 minute time course that was set up, which is about fourfold over time. Now we compare this to the central cell division gene, it said, and that only had a twofold downregulation event in comparison. So this data really stood to suggest that there is in fact an effect of DNA damage on the expression of the gene SSGB. But what is SSGB? SSGB is a streptomyces specific cell division protein. And what we know is that SSGB is essential for the completion of the sporulation uh, pros, uh, pathway in streptomyces. Uh, what we also know is that if you delete the gene for SSGB, you actually obtain a mutant which is genetically incapable of undergoing sporulation. So with the knowledge that in response to DNA damage, SSGB expression might be affected from the RNA-seq, um, with the idea that if DNA damage is grown in the present, uh, if you mix DNA damage with streptomyces, you block spore formation. And lastly, an SSGB null mutant does not sporulate. We came up with this sort of hypothesis where DNA damage leads to the downregulation of SSGB as a response in streptomyces. So to, in order to prove that hypothesis, I first performed reverse transcriptase PCR assays. And here um, I'm showing you cutouts of agros gels where I used primers specific to genes of interest to assess the transcription state with or without mitomycin C. And here I have two controls, no reverse transcriptase to ensure my RNA was clean, hard B, which is a vegetative sigma factor used as the internal control, and then my main genes of interest, SSGB, FITZ, and a sporulation regulator known as white B. And as you can see, in response to mitomycin C treatment, there is in fact a loss of SSGB transcription uh, uh, present in the, the RT-PCR reaction. If we compare this to FITZ, you can see that there's still a band present for FITZ transcription, but intensity appears to be slightly reduced. But kind of interestingly is that for white B, it appears that transcription was still, present, was still present in the presence of mitomycin. So this sort of supported the observation we made in the RNA-seq study, where perhaps there might be a stronger effect on cell division than on sporulation. So we move on from the transcription state of these genes to their protein levels, which I assessed using automated Western plotting. And here I've plotted for three proteins, white A, another sporulation regulator, which is the partner regulator to white B, and again, SSGB and FITZ. And just to add in this condition, um, in this experiment, sorry, white A is my internal control. And again, as you can see, in response to mitomycin C, there is a loss of SSGB protein. And while FITZ, has, FITZ protein levels have been reduced, um, it's still present in the system. 
So this data really supported the main hypothesis, which is the idea that prokaryotes, or not prokaryotes, streptomyces, a response to DNA damage in streptomyces involves a loss of SSGB uh, expression. But we wanted to dig deeper than that and ask why this might be important for the streptomyces. What is the importance of having SSGB or lack thereof? And to that end, we initially started out with some growth curves to assess how they might be growing in the presence of DNA damage. So what we have here is a growth curve for Streptomyces venezuelae, growth grown with or without mitomycin C at the sub-minimum inhibitory concentration of 0.25 microgram per mil. And in this case, we have two curves, the untreated sample in the green, which as you can see, forms a generally sigmoidal curve over time. And we compare that untreated curve to the treated curve grown with mitomycin C in the gray. And here we see that although the exponential stage is kind of similar near the beginning, over time, growth becomes a bit more unstable. And in fact, growth is impacted, likely due to the effects of mitomycin. So this is for the wild type strain. Now we compare the wild type uh, strain to a strain of streptomyces, which is overexpressing SSGB. And again, in this condition, we have two curves, the untreated sample, so just the SSGB overexpression by itself. And here it forms that sigmoidal curve over time. And we compare that to the SSGB overexpression strain uh, that's been grown in the presence of mitomycin C. And here we see something kind of interesting. We can see that for this experiment, you can see that by overexpressing SSGB in the presence of DNA damage, it appears that there's a it appears that there's a continued growth in the sense that it's, con it's continuing to accumulate mass over time. And this is in relative comparison to the wild type treated strain, which had a bit more negative effect overall. However, all this really all this experiment really shows us is that by growing by overexpressing SSGB and then growing in the presence of DNA damage growth just appears to continue. And it doesn't really inform us on the effects of development. And to that end, we collaborated with the Schlimpert Lab at the John Innes Center, where we've teamed up with them to use their microfluidic system to directly observe how streptomyces development is proceeding. So this system works by us taking the spores of streptomyces and then trapping them in this special plate on top of a microscope. We then use a perfusion system to pump in specialized media for our experiments. So in this case, it would be media containing mitomycin C to elicit DNA damage. And then we let the system run overnight. And by the end of the, and by the next day, we have these images of time-lapse microscopy to assess how, how uh, development might be occurring for streptomyces. Now the benchmark of the experiments I'm gonna show you in the following slides is based on a structure known as the Z-ring ladder. If we take a fluorescent protein such as YPET, and fuse it to the fit set protein, you can actually ob directly observe the process of sporulation occurring. So what happens then is as an, in a filament that's going to undergo sporulation, what you will see is that fit set with its counterpart fluorophore, it will, they will align themselves along the length of this filament. And when you see this sort of structure, it's indicative of the fact that this hyphae will undergo spore formation. So this is really just the static view of that phenomena. And it's even better when you watch the videos. So here on the, fluorescent on the fluorescent channel, you see the alignment of the Z rings over time, indicating that spore formation is in fact occurring in that hyphae. And I'm just gonna let this play back a little bit. And in the same hyphae on the rightmost side of the DIC channel, you can in fact see the spores forming as they compartmentalize uh, round and round out to form individual spore compartments. So just to reiterate, this video I'm showing you right now is a wild type strain expressing fluorescent fit Z and grown in sporulating conditions. We compare that video to a video where the wild type strain is expressing fluorescent fit said, but grown in the presence of mitomycin C or you know, DNA damage. And here we see a stark difference in the growth pattern. You can see that over time, while the streptomyces hyphae do uh, extend, extend over time and grow, they are in fact lysing. And this is indicated, indicated by the fact that these hyphae are sort of popping in and out of view on the fluorescent channel. If you observe the same effects on the DIC channel, you can see that the hyphae look like they're literally blowing up over time. So again, this is for the wild type strain, fluorescent fit said in the presence of DNA damage. Now we compare this video to a video of a strain which is overexpressing SSGB, uh, expressing fluorescent fit said and grown in the presence of DNA damage. And here we made two really interesting observations. We, said, we see that despite the, despite the fact that it is being grown in the presence of DNA damage, these hyphae uh, of the SSGB overexpression strain they're growing and extending quite uh, nicely in comparison to the wild type strain I just showed you previously. And there's not nearly as much lysis going on in this condition. Moreover, and more significantly in my opinion, is the fact that despite the fact that we're growing these uh, cells in the presence of DNA damage, you do in fact see the resumption of spore formation. So I'm gonna let the video play back again. 
And here you see the rapid formation of the Z-ring ladders in these hyphae in the fluorescent channel. And in the DIC channel, you see the compartmentalization and separation of the hyphae into individual spore uh, particles. So that uh, observation was really exciting because it appeared that we bypassed the phenotype that I described to you uh, earlier in the talk, where in the wild type strain, if you grow them in the presence of DNA damage, you prevent the spore formation process. But that does sort of call into question the quality of the spores that we produced by bypassing this phenotype. Um, so that really brings up the question then, if we overexpress SSGB in the presence of DNA damage, what, what is the quality of the spores that we've made in that condition? You know, are they normal? And to that end, we performed a spot dilution assay to assess how the streptomyces cells are specifically affected by DNA damage in terms of the overexpression strain. Um, okay, so what we have here is the SSGB overexpression strain where I've grown in just normal, uh, normal MYM media. And then I've taken those cultures and then spot diluted them up in to increase, increasing dilutions to assay their capability to form single colony forming units. So starting from the left, you can see that the undiluted sample forms in one big colony, but as you increase the dilution factor, you see individual colonies forming as the range increases. And this is in the, an indication that there are viable cells up until the highest dilution. We compare this untreated sample to the treated sample grown in the presence of mitomycin. And here we see a stark difference in terms of viability. Although the undiluted samples look kind of visually, uh, visually the same as the undiluted samples of the untreated strain, as you increase the dilution factor, there is in fact a drop off in the number of cells being formed um, in terms of as you increase the dilution factor. So this does suggest that despite the fact that in the presence of DNA damage, SSGP overexpression can grow and sporulate, uh, the resultant cells are not that great and it's really just accumulating mass over time. Okay, so with regards to where this work would go as we move along towards um, the future. Well, I think the most important point that I kind of want to bring up is the fact that, uh, as I described to you in the beginning of the talk, the most well-described DNA damage response in bacteria is known as the SOS response. And in essence, I haven't really directly addressed that physiological response myself. So I think it will be really important to know how SSGB, uh, how the SSGB effect of DNA damage uh, has an interplay with what's known about SOS responses in other bacteria. And an, an additional consideration to that is that how does an SOS response even work in a developmental microorganism like Streptomyces? So that would be a significant step forward in this topic. And on a similar note, I think it would be really interesting to figure out what kind of factor is actually affecting SSGB expression. To my knowledge, there's at least three developmental factors which could affect SSGB expression during normal streptomyces development. And I think figuring out which one would be really interesting. And, and it could also be something that we don't even know uh, exists just yet. So that's where we could go from here. But for now, I think I'll just leave you with this general model by saying that the streptomyces are very interesting bacteria because of their morphological complexity. And what we know about the completion of that their life cycle is that SSGB must be present in order to complete the spore formation process. What I've discovered is that if you grow the streptomyces in the presence of DNA damage, you actually block the spore forming process. And part of that response could be a lack of SSGB present to prevent sporulation, sporulation specific cell division in a deleterious condition. So with that then, I'd like to just thank everyone that's gotten this project this far. I wanted to thank Justin for supervising me and guiding me and training me as I've been going through my degree. And also in particular for his introduction for him introducing me to his friends and colleagues at the, at the John Innes Center in the UK with specific reference to the Schlimpert Lab. So I want to thank them, uh, Susan Schlimpert and Matt Bush for their training and time to help me out with my project and always answer my questions as we've moved along. So with that, I just want to close off and say for everyone listening to stay safe and stay healthy and I'll be happy to take any of your questions now. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you very much, Jan. It was really interesting. Um, got some very nice videos of streptomyces. Um, does anyone have any questions for Jan? Um, so a question from Matt Hutchings. Do yes. any other DNA damaging antibiotics have the same effect? Yes, uh, let me just pull up that slide. So I've, I've never, in terms of my experiments, I've never done a never done anything separate from mitomycin C. But in a previous paper from our lab, what we've shown is, so in the white, the white zone is indication that sporulation hasn't happened and the green zone is the spores themselves. 
And what we've seen is that for at least these five, these four antibiotics, novobicin, ciprofloxacin, mitomycin, and bleomycin, you can see the, the, the prevention of sporulation-specific cell division in those sub-MIC zones. So that's about the best way I can describe that. Okay, thank you. Um, so another question, uh, when you overexpressed SSGB and induced DNA damage, did you also see a difference in spore morphology? Yes, um, I don't, let me see if I have a picture of that. Uh, well, okay, yes, there is a difference in spore morphology, but it looks like I don't have an actual picture of that other than the video that I showed you. So they're a bit more elongated, and I guess the right, the way, the right way we've been describing them, as I've been talking to Justin, is spore-like particles, so, because they're a bit longer and they're a bit more oblong sometimes, so it's really varied. Okay. Um, so another question. Um, in the SSGB plus plus, the DNA should still be damaged. Do you see that happening? Uh, yes, to an extent. Let me pull that up. Um, so I can't say like precisely how it is damaged, but based on the so this was this is an experiment performed by Matt Bush where he stained for the DNA, and just to really just cut to the punchline, this bottom part is the SSGB overexpression grown in the presence of DNA damage. And you can see that in comparison to the untreated sample where there's strong fluorescence in each of these spore-like particles. Oh, I did have a picture of it, I guess. Um, in response to these, um, in response to the fluorophore, there's strong fluorescence in the untreated sample. But if you compare that to the overexpression strain with DNA damage, it appears that there's a, the fluorescence isn't, a, isn't as strong. So perhaps, yes, there's, a, there's still damaged DNA in there, which could contribute to the lack of viability as you um, that as I showed you earlier. Thank you. Um, so a question from Morgan on Twitter. Um, she says, really interesting talk. Um, she was wondering if you can isolate any suppressor mutants that sporulate in the presence of mitomycin C and do they overexpress SSGB? So in terms of suppressor mutants being isolated, um, I, if you leave them in the incubator long enough, they event like let's say for the wild type strain. If you leave that incub if you leave them incubated long enough, they will eventually sporulate. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they're sporulating. They were overexpressing SSGB though. I can I couldn't answer that. So I kind of not really. I, sorry, to, I don't think I answered that very well. Okay, um, so I'll just uh, go for one more question um, from okay. Bella. Um, do you know why the bacteria lies? Um, in bacillus DNA damage, you often induce prophage induction, which causes the ly lice. Is this ah. in streptomyces? So I looked in the RNA-seq data for anything indicative of prophage genes, and I couldn't find any. At least, yeah. yeah. But that that's really it. I mean, I've been asked that before, which is a good point. I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of anything regarding, and I, I'm not aware of any prophages, at least from my data set. Ooh, uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you for a great talk. And we'll now hand over to Rebecca from the University of Strathclyde, who's going to talk to us about Oridox. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to try and uh, get back to the screen. Okay, hi. Um, so, oh. There we go. Hi everyone, so I am Becca and I'm now a postdoc in Paul Hoskinson's lab at the University of at the University of Strathclyde. Um, but I've not heard my Bible yet and I've just started the position very recently. So today I'm going to talk you through some of the work that I carried out over the course of my PhD. So I was a joint student between and Paul Hoskinson's lab at the University of Strathclyde but also Andy Rose group over at the University of Glasgow and throughout the course of my project uh, we aim to investigate a little bit about how the specialised metabolites uh, from streptomyces species that we work on in Paul Hoskinson's lab can potentially go on to inhibit the E. coli infections that are studied in Andy's group. So um, most of my work is focused on Oridox, it's this molecule on the left here. Um, it was originally discovered back in 1969 as part of a a large scale uh, project to discover new uh, compounds that inhibit the growth of gram positive organisms and, and it's particularly active against Staphylococcus uh, and Streptococcus. Is everything all right? 
we can't see your screen. You can't see the screen. No. Um. Okay, we're good. Sorry about that. We're good. That's uh, okay. Um, back to here. Okay. Um, so um, it was active against. Uh, it's particularly active against Staphylococcus and Streptococcus, um, and it, it does have a weak activity against uh, some gram-negative bacteria. You can see that structurally the compound is quite similar to Chlamydia of Streptomyces colitis. The main difference being. Uh, the Oridox has this methylation to the head group, this pedal ring here, that Kyromycin doesn't have. And with that structural similarity, it uh, brings a functional uh, similarity, and both compounds work in quite a similar way. They're both alpha-mycin compounds, meaning that their target is elongation factor, thermo-unstable, or EFTU. Um, and by binding to EFTU, uh, um, you can prevent it from dissociating from the ribosome during protein synthesis, um, and therefore uh, inhibit protein synthesis in the, in the cell, and the cell will die. But it was of particular interest to us, actually, that Oridox was identified from um, a large-scale drug screen, or natural product screen, back in 2011 by uh, Kimura and their co-workers as a potential inhibitor of the intrapathogenic E. coli type 3 secretion system. And that's interesting to us because uh, intrapathogenic E. coli and intrahemorrhagic E. coli, its more severe cousin, um, actually are, are very difficult to treat. There are currently no antibiotic treatments recommended uh, for this uh, treatment, and it actually goes on kind of from what Jan was saying. If you give a traditional antibiotic to uh, to these uh, to the to patients suffering from one of these infections, you're likely to induce the SOS response, which actually in turn will upregulate uh, toxin production through the prophage. So that can have some really severe consequences for patients in particular. Um, it can result in the dissemination of the bacteria from the gut uh, to a more systemic infection that can actually be fatal uh, in EHEC patients uh, and in particular in children. Um, so the idea would be that we could try and study Oridox a little bit to see if it was if it's possible uh, to use Oridox as a, a type 3 secretion system inhibitor, because this secretion system is essential for colonization. And if you can inhibit colonization, you can potentially render that, that E. coli kind of harmless in the gut. So in order to do this, so that's Oridox binding, sorry. Uh, in order to do this, uh, we wanted to, to look at kind of both sides of the problem. So how does Oridox work? What's the kind of scope and the range of the compound? Uh, and what's its mechanism of action? But we'll also find out a little bit about how it's made in its biosynthetic gene cluster in order to really open that biosynthetic pathway up to kind of synthetic biology approaches to potentially making some novel derivatives of compounds. So my first experiment was to characterize the effect of the compound. And we have intrapathogenic, intrahemorrhagic, and uh, E. coli there. And you also have Citrobacter redentium. Um, and what you can see is when we've treated the, the uh, cultures with increasing concentrations of Oridox, you can see uh, decreasing concentrations of type 3 secretion system associated proteins uh, within the supernatant until we get to about 5 micrograms per mil, where we see no detectable type 3 secretion at all. Um, so it, that's fairly small, uh, small concentrations of the compound. But it's important to note that at these concentrations, we actually don't see any effect on growth at all. Um, so that's, that indicates that potentially the mechanism of type 3 secretion system inhibition is separate from that EFTU binding that we see in, in gram-positive bacteria, for example. Um, next step then was to, to try and, and understand a little bit about how the compound itself actually uh, how it, it, affected the ability of EHEC to attach in the face epithelial cells. So we've set up this epithelial cell model with GFP tagged EHEC bacteria. In our untreated sample, you can see here these uh, uh, microcolonies formed by the bacteria, and they're forming these actin lesions or pedestals that are really characteristic of EHEC infection. And if you look what, if you, on a wider context, you can see that the cells are, um, the cells are quite sick and, and rounded even in some cases. 
When we treat the cells with Oridox, although the bacteria are still living there fairly happily, they aren't able to actually form these tight junctions because their type 3 secretion system is being inhibited. Um, so, well, yeah, so they're living there quite happily and they're just not able to do the same kind of cell damage. And when we actually quantify this as a colonization efficiency, we can see a 7,000 fold reduction in colonization efficiency. So it's fairly uh, potent at what it does. And just briefly on the mechanism of action, we were able, we were able to decipher this through some uh, trans whole transcriptome analysis, and um, where we found that although only around three percent of the EHEC genome was affected when treated with Oridox, when we homed in on this uh, Lee pathogenicity island that encodes for the type three secretion system in EHEC, we saw that forty one of the forty two genes were then regulated in the presence of Oridox. And what was also interesting to us was that this gene here, LER, which is a master virulence regulator in E. coli, was downregulated quite significantly. And also other, uh, other genes, non-LE genes, uh, other not sorry, non-LE genes uh, that are still regulated by LER and other areas of the genome were also downregulated in the presence of Oridox. Um, I won't get into too much detail of the mechanism of action today, but overall our data support a model whereby Oridox acts somewhere upstream of layer in its regulatory pathway in order to inhibit its expression and then therefore inhibit the expression of the type 3 secretion system and several other virulence genes in E. coli. And just briefly, this ex experiment was making us, and again, we're looking just as by coincidence also at the SOS response here. Um, and we were able to measure that through, through rec -A expression to, to determine whether Oridox had a negative uh, effect on um, the SOS response, did it induce it, and therefore in, induce sugar toxin production. And you can see that compared to ciprofloxacin, for example, where the, the rec -A response has increased, we don't see that in our Oridox treated cultures, and that corresponds actually to our Western blot here, where with ciprofloxacin there's a high level of sugar toxin there, whereas uh, we don't see uh, Oridox uh, inducing that at all. So overall, uh, the fact that Oridox can inhibit the ability of EHEC uh, to attach and face these epithelial cells, um, so it, it does such a good job of that, but also uh, it does this without inducing the sugar toxin response like traditional antibiotics. Um, it nominates Oridox as a, as a fairly um, interesting potential uh, compound that can be used for an antibiotic strategy. And with that in mind, we therefore wanted to understand a little bit more about the compound itself. So we sequenced the whole genome of the producing the strange streptomyces goldeniensis, uh, and we ran that through anti-smash uh, to try and identify a potential biosynthetic gene cluster uh, responsible for its production. And this cluster here uh, was of particular interest to us as it had a high level of similarity to the keromycin gene cluster in this alluded to that the compounds are structurally very similar so it would make sense that their gene cluster would share some kind of homology. Um, and we actually look uh, at this cluster, it's part of a much larger super cluster. Uh, so the cluster pulled out by anti-smash is about 270 kilobases and it appears to encode for five different independently regulated uh, compounds. But this part here, the Oridox cluster, is what we're interested in. Um, and we did think that potentially the repetitive nature of, of the PKS genes may have led to this cluster being, or the gene, the, the assembly, uh, or this cluster being placed within this larger cluster as an artifact of the assembly that we were able to PCR over the regions in order to determine the position of the, the cluster and it's definitely within this larger supercluster. So when we actually home in on that Oridox encoding region, we found that the, uh, 23 of the 25 genes within the cluster have functional homologues in the Kermison cluster. Um, the main difference being these two additional genes, firstly, or M star, which is an additional putative uh, SAM dependent OMI cell transferase that we believe to be responsible for that methylation to, to convert keromycin to Oridox, and also RH1, the hypothetical protein. So in order to confirm the role of, of this gene cluster in Oridox biosynthesis, uh, we wanted to express it uh, neutrologously. So we had the cluster cloned onto a bacterial artificial chromosome. And then at that point, we had to try and choose a, a sufficient host in order to, to carry out this expression. Um, and that was, we knew that was going to be a little bit more complicated 
because there are multiple genes involved in erythromycin resistance. So within the Autodox gene cluster and the keromycin gene cluster, there's a major facilitator superfamily type export pump um, that, that is involved in resistance. But also we know that a lot of these erythromycin producers encode additional copies of elongation factor two um, that, that play a role in resistance, especially during biosynthesis. So we chose a range of strains. We chose Streptomyces celicolor M1152, um, classic superhost or a great superhost. Um, um, and that has multiple copies of EFTU, one of which appears to be resistant. Streptomyces colinus, uh, the keromycin producer, um, also having the correct uh, resistant mechanisms. Streptomyces venezuela should, uh, in theory, be resistant to orodox with, with that with that one copy of a resistant EFTU. And Streptomyces albus doesn't have any um, resistant copies of EFTU. And we also assessed uh, the resistance phenotypes uh, in the lab. So when we expressed this back in um, Streptomyces colinus and Streptomyces celicolor, we saw orodox production and therefore uh, confirmed the role of orodox biosynthesis, uh, that this gene cluster in orodox biosynthesis. And we were also able to confirm that the orodox obtained from this expression wasn't able, was able to inhibit type 3 secretion in EHEC. Um, so we didn't see any production in Streptomyces venezuela or Streptomyces albus. So we asked the question, can the, uh, can the addition of another copy of E of elongation factor 2 or TUF2 facilitate orodox biosynthesis in some of these strains? And certainly for Streptomyces venezuela, that was the case. When we, uh, when we expressed an additional copy of TUF2, this resistant EFTU, in Streptomyces venezuela, we immediately saw quite large quantities of orodox. And uh, Streptomyces albus, um, our bioassays and our extracts do point to Streptomyces albus producing orodox. However, it was the very last uh, set of LCMS samples I had to uh, do in the lab before um, I had to abruptly leave due to COVID. So I haven't been able to run the LCMS, but I'm pretty sure that Streptomyces albus is now making orodox with the addition of this extra copy of EFTU. So that, that provides evidence that both gene, genes are required uh, for self-resistance to orodox during uh, biosynthesis. So with that in mind, and now and being able to confirm, again, I carried out a knockout also of these PKS genes here uh, to, to confirm the role of those specific poly, uh, PKS genes in orodox biosynthesis. But again, those samples were my, my last uh, set to be run on the LCMS. Um, but overall, we could start looking at um, or contrasting and comparing the orodox biosynthetic pathway to that of the Kermycin gene, uh, originally published by, by Tillman Weber back in and his co-workers back in 2008. And by and large, um, in terms of this, this hybrid PKS MRBS gene cluster, um, orodox appears to follow the same or a very similar biosynthetic pathway we will see this unusual combination of cis and transactin ATs, uh, ACL transferases, uh, facilitating the structural complexity of the compound. And we also have ORD, this aspartate D carboxylase, providing beta alanine to the pathway uh, at that final PCP. And then we've got a dichromate cyclase that will simultaneously uh, cleave this intermediate from the PCP uh, and, sit and cyclize the pyrrole ring. We believe that the initial uh, tailoring reactions are the same as, as chemomycin. We'll see the, the reduction and addition of that methyl group, the hydroxylation of carbon 30 and the formation of that double bond there, and then the hydroxylation of, of carbon 16 and the, the closure of the tetrahydrofurane ring. Um, but finally, we've, we've then got we've then got chemomycin essentially. So we hypothesized that or M star could catalyze the um, or M star could catalyze the conversion of orodox of chemomycin to orodox. So to test this, we expressed or M star in um, the chemomycin producer Streptomyces colinus, um, and, or, and, and we had some evidence that chemomycin was the final orodox precursor because when we actually uh, ferment Streptomyces goldeniensis, we often see a peak that a, a minor peak that corresponds to the molecular weight and. Um, of, of, of chemomycin as well as the molecular weight of orodox suggesting that, it, that it's probably a, a precursor. Um, 
So we express this additional, this um, RM star and this keromycin producer streptomyces colinus under a TIP-A promoter. Um, and we had some trouble with that because I think maybe thyrostreptone and Oridox plus keromycin might have been a bit overwhelming to the cell, so our biomass was often low, but eventually we, we tightened in the right amount of, of uh, thyrostreptone and it's leaky anyway to get the expression of RM star. And we finally saw the conversion of keromycin to Oridox within streptomyces colitis. Um, yeah, so that confirmed that methylation of keromycin is the final step in Oridox biosynthesis. And then just finally, when we, we look at these strains, we can try to kind of use this experiment to differentiate what came first. The chicken and egg question was Oridox or which are those first, which is the daughter? And can we find any clues as to the answer to this question? Well, when we grow streptomyces colinus expressing this RM star and therefore producing Oridox, uh, with, against the empty vector control, we can see that it inhibits its growth quite significantly. Uh, suggesting that this simple methylation to the compound is enough to overcome the resistant alphamycin, the alphamycin resistance mechanisms of streptomyces colinus. Um, and this, this isn't too surprising because this magic methylation uh, concept is known in medicinal chemistry. Simple methylations to compounds can quite often change their activity quite significantly. But what it suggests to us is, is really they both have this efflux pump that shares about 60% amino acid similarity. So with, with, with that, it suggests that the resistance mechanisms within Streptomyces bulgariensis has have evolved with that methylation and then probably gives us a clue that uh, Streptomyces, uh, that Oridox is a daughter cluster. We've also carried out uh, quite a lot of uh, of genome comparisons and recombination detection software that predicts some evolutionary um, that predicts some evolutionary um, uh, changes there. Uh, sorry, the check. Uh, ev evolutionary recombination between the two compounds. Uh, so just finally, um, in summary, Oridox inhibits the attachment and effacement of EHEC to the epithelial cells, and it does this via the downregulation of the type 3 secretion system and several other virulence genes at EHEC, uh, all via the down regulation of the master virulence regulator layer. And it also does this um, without inducing the sugar toxin response in the same way many tradi traditional antibiotics do. We've now also identified the Oridox biosynthetic gene cluster and its resistance mechanisms, and we've started to unpick a little bit about how Oridox is actually biosynthesized. And just finally, uh, and from a, from a future work, we'd like to sequence Streptomyces ramosissimus, which is a, a keromycin producer, and some other alphamycin producers to try to do some comparisons between the strains again to try to work out how, how they might have arose. Uh, and uh, yeah, ultimately, our aim is to produce novel derivatives, and hopefully, out of the course of my PhD, which I've finished up now, um, I've provided enough kind of preliminary uh, work for the next person who takes on the project to do that. And finally, uh, just thanks to everyone that's been involved, involved everyone in Paul Hoskinson's group, Andy Rose's group, uh, uh, Wolfgang for giving us the, the strains, and everyone that's given me some funding over the, the course of the PhD. And just, yeah, thanks everyone. Stay safe. Thank you, Sarah. 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 Thank you, Becca, for a really interesting talk. Thank um, you. Does anyone have any questions for Becca? Um, we have got one here from Anne. She asks, would integration of extra TUF2 copies enhance Oridox production in strains already producing Oridox? Um, I would imagine it, it would do. And it's probably something we can quite easily look at. Um, we see, we, oh, well, yes, in fact, because when, when I tried it in streptomyces colinus, even though that already has a resistant copy of elongation factor two and streptomyces uh, celo color, uh, even though it already they already have that resistance copy, it does appear that an, an extra copy again of the same elongation factor two will actually increase the, the orthodox uh, yield there. Okay, thank you. Um, it's another question from here, Les. Um, he says, you expressed TUF TUF2 and saw production of Oridox. Did you try to express to Oridox resistant variant of E. coli EFTU? Uh, 
If so, what happened? Sorry, could you repeat the, just the second half of that? Question? Oh, so did, did you try to express an Oridox resistant variant of E. coli EFTU? If so, what happened? Oh, um, in terms of type 3 secretion system or? Uh, so did, did I try, oh, sorry, okay, that makes sense. Did I try to express a copy of EFTU that doesn't appear to be resistant from its amino acid sequence? Uh, no, I didn't do that, but that would make sense because then I could determine whether or not it was the specific mutations that were conferring resistance or just overall copy number playing a role. Um, but yeah, that would be an interesting experiment. Great, thank you. Um, do we have any more questions? Okay, well, I think if anyone has any more questions, I'm sure the speakers will be happy to um, answer those um, on Twitter or any kind of contact details. Um, so thank you everyone for tuning in. We will be back um, next week at 2pm. Um, and just um, So next week we'll be hearing from Scott Jarmusch from Uppsala University. And also Magdalena Kotowska from um, the Hertzfield Institute of Immunology and Experimental Therapy. So, um, and that'll be at 2 p.m. next Thursday. So, thank you everyone for tuning in this week. Um, hope everyone stays safe, stays healthy, um, and thank you very much to our speakers as well. <laughs>